Yes, if you can believe it, as of May 2024, the show SpongeBob SquarePants is 25 years old. 25 years since SpongeBob first dazzled the world with its fantastic humor, memorable characters, and a surprising amount of fire for a show that took place underwater. Hey, if we're underwater, how can there be a... Created by Steven Hillenburg in 1999, the show's golden age of episodes between 1999 and 2004 have become indelible fixtures of pop culture. If you weren't into SpongeBob, it might be a little hard to grasp what a cultural phenomenon it was. In terms of its cultural impact, SpongeBob was basically The Simpsons for kids. The early 2000s was this crazy time when it felt like everybody liked this one show. Kids liked it, adults liked it, cats liked it. It had universal appeal. <laughs> I watch it with the grandkids, and sometimes I watch it when I'm by myself. Actor Rob Lowe is a fan. The best SpongeBob episode ever is Sailor Mouth. I have plenty of children in my life, and I watch it as an adult by myself. This dance called SpongeBob Dance, and I know how to do it. I love SpongeBob. I've had older people come up, old men. You're a mermaid man? I said, I'm mermaid man. Oh my goodness, and I meet him in person. How about that? <laughs> It reached a point where I just assumed any other kid I met liked Spongebob. But it wasn't just the kids. My teenage brothers and their friends liked Spongebob. My parents liked Spongebob. Sometimes they'd watch it by themselves. The parents of other kids I knew liked Spongebob. But of course, being a kid's show, obviously not everyone watched it. I think Spongebob represents a dividing line between two halves of the millennial generation. You're either a younger Spongebob millennial like myself, or you're an older non-Spongebob millennial, where maybe you were aware of the show, but you were a bit too old to be Nickelodeon's target demographic, so it kind of passed you by. Or maybe you were too young to enjoy it in those first few years. You may not have even been born yet. So it's understandable if you missed the boat on SpongeBob during its peak, but if you did watch the show during its golden age and you didn't like it, I guess my question for you is, what's it like not having a soul? Let me know in the comments. Even if you didn't watch the show yourself, you may have overheard the annoying theme song blasting through the TV speakers while one of your siblings or kids watched the show, telling them to drop on the deck and plop like a fish. And plop like a fish we did. Even as an adult, I still drop down and plop like a fish sometimes. And people around me go, Oh my god, what's happening? I think this man needs help! <laughs> Non-SpongeBob fans just don't get it. You know what's hilarious about that theme song is the creators made it annoying on purpose. Steve's idea was to try to make the most annoying song you can to, so in Saturday morning when kids turn the TV on and parents are trying to sleep, you have this pirate screaming in the other room for the kids to jump on the floor. <laughs> and annoying though it may be, it has a way of getting stuck in your head. I think we all remember how it goes. Oh! Who lives at 124 Con Street? SpongeBob SquarePants! And despite what I thought for most of my life, that theme song was apparently not sung by Clancy Brown, the voice actor who does Mr. Krabs. Where's me formula, Plankton? Which is insane because it sounds just like him. Are y'all ready, kids? And speaking of Clancy Brown, I don't know if I'll ever be able to watch anything with him in it again without hearing Mr. Krabs. What are you Jimmy staring at? Back to work! And I'll definitely never be able to watch my favorite 1980s bug spray ads without hearing Mrs. Puff. Black Flag, you're my exterminator. <laughs> now, since the first three seasons are generally considered the show's golden age, and those are the ones I grew up on, this video is going to focus on that era of the show. I think what really set Spongebob apart wasn't just that adults could also enjoy the show, it was how they enjoyed the show. Typically when it comes to kids shows, kids and adults enjoy them on different levels, if adults even enjoy them at all. The traditional formula for a kid's cartoon, at least at that time, was that most of the humor was aimed at kids with an occasional joke thrown in for adults, usually in the form of innuendo or metaphors that would fly over the kids' heads but would make the adults in the room chuckle. <laughs> I don't think that's gonna fit. Just a little more, dear. <coughs> Got it. Riptar Redux. And my personal favorite, Lonely Space Vixen. Oh. Now that's for after you go to bed. I'm the professor. He made us in his laboratory by accident. Don't worry, professor. I was an accident, too. And Spongebob did have its share of that, Squidward sardonically implying that Spongebob's ugly pride was actually gay pride. Oh! Is that what he calls it? The karate episode being an analogy for abstinence, where Spongebob and Sandy try to resist the urge to do a karate with each other after Mr. Krabs has forbidden it. Karate? Right now? I mean, no! Then they find a loophole where they can chop up sandwich ingredients without actually doing karate with each other, until finally, by the end of the episode, they give in to the urge completely. <laughs> if the ocean is rockin', don't come... flockin'. 
Like the joke of this is that SpongeBob has something he's not allowed to do, and Sandy just wants to do it all the time. There's that all, thing yeah. being, of course, karate. Well, this, great. Is, right. this is so Freudian, guys. <laughs> and then there were moments that weren't innuendo, but still somehow felt vaguely suggestive. <laughs> Maybe that was just me. Cartoons would also throw in cultural references that weren't suggestive, but were still mainly intended for older viewers. Oh, hey, you squished Buster! SpongeBob dabbled in those kinds of cultural references too, references that I didn't get until I was much older. SpongeBob saying, hello, Dolly. Hi, guy with the flu. And hello, Dolly! A parody of Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart, where a guy goes crazy thinking he hears the beating heart of a man he killed and hid under his floorboards. I did it! I took the boots! They're here! Under the floorboard! By the way, I contend that this is the funniest Mr. Krabs ever looked. I took the boots! The French narrator being a parody of Jacques Cousteau's TV show from the 1970s. Through these doors pass all the many kinds of undersea life. We'll live among them to film their complex social life in the natural environment of the sea. It means another whole year of boarding school! And then there are some things that I'm not sure if they're references or not. Who are you calling Pinhead? Is Patrick supposed to look like someone specific here? Why does he have human features, a single tooth, and a tie around his neck? And the DVD commentary specifies the exact artist who drew this gag, and I sent him an email, but I haven't gotten a reply. Maybe it's not a reference, maybe it's just a random funny drawing, I don't know. But I have wondered about this for a long time. So that's how kid shows typically did it. There was one level of jokes for kids, and another level of jokes for adults. And for the most part, both audiences enjoy the humor on a different level. But with SpongeBob, I noticed something different when I was a kid. I noticed that if there were adults in the room, they were laughing at the same parts the kids were. Does this look dangerous? No innuendo or old references, just clever jokes or silly gags. I actually have a distinct core memory of my friend's mom laughing at this moment in the show. I never let you have this boat, not even if you were <gasps> Mrs. Puff. That's when it clicked in my head that this show was different. It was silly and weird in a way that could make adults laugh too. SpongeBob slowly became a show that my whole family would watch, and we would laugh at a lot of the same parts. SpongeBob writer Jay Lender said, Chuck Jones used to say about the old Warner Brothers shorts that we didn't make them for kids, and we didn't make them for adults. We made them for ourselves. And that's what we were doing on SpongeBob. Animation director Tom Yasumi said, Even though SpongeBob is marketed as a children's show, I don't think any of us here make the show for the kids. We make what makes us adults laugh. And that's why SpongeBob had such broad appeal. It was a legitimately funny show. Sometimes it was clever and funny in a way that worked on paper. Patrick's back and forth with Man Ray about his wallet that's been turned into a meme. That makes sense to me. Then take it. It's not my wallet. It plays out like a bit you'd see on The Simpsons. It works even if you just read the words. What? Ah! Oops. What's in that box anyhow? My wallets. Patrick misunderstanding the meaning of the word genius. That's it. Patrick, your genius is showing. Where? Which, by the way, raises the question, what does Patrick think Spongebob is? Spongebob, you're a genius! Sometimes the humor was just goofy. See? That's what it'd be like if you had me for a face! I got gloves for my glove action figure! Is mayonnaise an instrument? No, Patrick, mayonnaise is not an instrument. <laughs> oh, that's right, honey. We don't have a son. And here's a little fun fact I like to tell people. The character in that last clip was played by Tom Wilson, who famously played Biff in Back to the Future, the antagonist of Marty. And in SpongeBob, his character's name was, ironically, Marty. Isn't that right, Janet? You bet, Marty. And I'm tired of people telling me that that's not interesting. It is. It's interesting! Sometimes the show was random and absurd, and that stuff could often be the funniest. I don't know why a guy screaming about chocolate was so funny, but it was. Could we interest you in some chocolate? Chocolate? CHOCOLATE! CHOCOLATE! The fact is, there's an art to random comedy, and SpongeBob did it well. Most importantly, can you do this? <gasps> It all worked because I think the show was being made by genuinely funny people doing jokes that they thought were funny. And man, let me tell you, somebody on that SpongeBob staff really thought it was funny to lick things that aren't meant to be licked. My license. Sand licking. I gotta lick the model. And now you. I'm so close to solving this crime, I can almost taste it. 
I think all SpongeBob fans have certain random lines that have cemented themselves in their brains. There are lines from the show that I'll probably remember for the rest of my life, not even necessarily because they were so funny, but because there was just something about the delivery that got stuck in my head. For me, it's stuff like the way SpongeBob says, getting kinda bored. Uh, getting kinda bored. Ah. Or this bottle. You told me to keep it in. This bottle. Why these particular lines have stuck with me for over two decades, I don't know. I mean, I still think about the phrase big meaty claws like once a week. Big meaty claws! And speaking of big meaty claws, I think that might be my favorite recurring side character on the show. And I use the term character loosely because it's not exactly a character. This same fish shows up multiple times throughout the show with a totally different voice. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? It's really the voice itself that's recurring. It exists as its own independent entity inhabiting different characters. So I just call it yelling British voice. Hi everybody, let's throw peanuts at him and see how he likes it. If I don't get my wish, it'll be your head. You sir are the greatest artist who ever lived. It's like a spirit that possesses people's bodies and speaks through them. Big meaty Claws! And part of the reason for the show's many memorable lines is that the voice actors use storyboards to inform their vocal performances. Tom Kenny said, I do a bunch of different series, and some of them are very script-driven. SpongeBob is so visually oriented. If I don't have storyboard to accompany my dialogue scripts, there's no point. I'm lost. The pictures are everything, and the action is everything. When you see SpongeBob's words out of context, it doesn't help. So I always read the storyboards the day before recording. They also recorded episodes with a full cast in the same room, allowing the actors to bounce off of each other in a more organic way. Tom Kenny said, We always record with a full cast, which is getting more unusual. That's another thing that's given Spongebob its special feel. Everybody's in the same room, doing it old radio show style. Recording engineer Crandall Cruz said, There really was a feeling that the actors were all in there collaborating, and a lot of improv. They ad-libbed all the time. It was fun re-watching Spongebob as an adult because there were some parts that made me laugh that didn't make me laugh as a kid, and it wasn't the obscure cultural references or the fact that the karate episode was actually about doing it. It was the silly and absurd stuff. I actually have a deeper appreciation for the absurdity of the show as an adult. If I may wax philosophical, for a moment. I think it's because you develop a sharper sense for absurdity as you age, you know? Growing up is all about learning the rules of life, the rules of social norms. And now it only hurts when you touch it. <laughs> touch! The rules of physics the rules of logic. And so as you get older, you become more and more familiar with how things are supposed to be, which then makes absurdity stand out more. So there's stuff that didn't make me laugh as a kid, but did as an adult. Spongebob and Patrick being electrocuted into piles of ash and crawling away. This is a job for Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy! The way Spongebob and Patrick dramatically leap through the air to save Mr. Krabs. <laughs> it's the Mr. Krabs! The audience at the Fry Cook Games getting cooked in oil. Here. The way the surfer dude laughs. <laughs> you just view things differently as an adult. I mean, when I was a kid, I believed that taste was subjective and everyone was entitled to their own opinion. And then I got older and learned that some people thought that Wormy was a bad SpongeBob episode, and I realized that some opinions are objectively wrong, and some people's brains are objectively, empirically, full of dookie. There was also a great joy in getting older and seeing that certain small moments in the show that stood out to me also stood out to other people. When I was young, I always thought the way that caveman Spongebob defensively turned around towards Squidward in this scene was so funny. And when I was younger, I'd always see that moment and think, I wonder if anyone else notices that and thinks it's funny. So I was delighted when years later that moment became a meme. It was like, oh hey, other people did notice that and they thought it was funny too. And rewatching the show, I also noticed a couple of subtle callbacks that I never picked up on before, like Mr. Krabs using hair curlers. What about all the stuff you stole? What do you mean? Mrs. Pop Hair curlers? That one was a gift. He wears curlers to bed! What? It's not what you think! Or Patrick thinking that buckets are hats. And I got this hat! Scary. Well, I think we could probably. <gasps> Mother! This game stinks. One of the things I loved about the show was that it was so fundamentally cartoony, and that might sound like stating the obvious, but Spongebob had a cartooniness in its DNA that a lot of other cartoons don't. The show had a funny inconsistency with itself. The details of the world would change for the sake of a gag or for the sake of a storyline. As if I really look like this! The surfer dude dies in one episode. Oh! Then he shows up a few episodes later alive and well. Oh! In Club Spongebob, there's a giant beanstalk right outside their homes. Why? Well, so that Spongebob and Patrick can have a treehouse that sets the episode's storyline in motion. 
just never explained how the beanstalk got there when it was never there before. If the episode needs it, it's there. I mean, I don't even know how many versions of the Krusty Krab kitchen there are. In most episodes, the grill is right next to the window so that SpongeBob can interact with Squidward. But then in the Nasty Patty, the grill has moved so that SpongeBob and Mr. Krabs can more easily look through the window at the health inspector. In Your Shoes Untied, the grill is on the other end of the kitchen so that they can do gags related to SpongeBob's untied shoes. In Just One Bite, there is suddenly a giant patty vault in the middle of the kitchen. They didn't usually explain how these things happened or why things were changing. They would disregard consistency and logic as long as it served the episode. Sometimes the story beats were cartoony, with inciting incidents like Squidward thinking he accidentally fed SpongeBob a bomb that's gonna kill him. <laughs> or conflict resolutions like Plankton's coin-operated self-destruct. Coin-operated self-destruct. Not one of my better ideas. And I think a big part of the reason for that cartooniness is that the show is very storyboard driven, where artists are given a basic storyline and have to flesh it out by drawing it like a comic. And the great thing about that approach is that there are jokes and gags that you discover by storyboarding that I think you just don't stumble on by writing a script. Hey, what are you standing on anyway? Especially with visual comedy. Spongebob had a ton of visual gags, and sometimes those were the funniest things. You could tell the artists and animators were really having fun with it. Obviously, visual humor is a part of all cartoons, but Spongebob took it to another level. It had these really exaggerated, Looney Tunes-ish visual gags. You know, gags that still work even if you watch the show on mute. <laughs> Mr. Krabs, a customer! <laughs> we got to do a lot of cartoon gags. Exploited animation as much as possible. <laughs> And besides the big gags, there were also these funny little ways the characters would behave kind of as other things were happening. The way other characters would grab or move SpongeBob like he was an object and he didn't seem to notice or care. Or after his insane journey through time, Squidward time travels back to the present where SpongeBob and Patrick are standing as if they knew he would appear right in front of them. Or cutting to the next day and SpongeBob and Patrick both walk out of their houses at the exact same time. SpongeBob being violently shaken into a daze by Mrs. Puff. Extra credit, SpongeBob! The extra credit! <laughs> there were also these quick, blink and you miss it gags happening away from the focal point of the shot, just thrown in for that tiny extra bit of comedy, Patrick being amused by the tool that he's holding, or saying yay and then looking disinterested. We're ready! Yay! And it wasn't just gags, the show was full of funny visuals, it looked funny. The way the characters moved, the facial expressions, the camera angles, the whole visual language of the show had a funny style. Stop. I think part of the show's broad appeal was also its simplicity. The episode's settings were usually local, they often took place at a character's home or at the Krusty Krab or nearby. The storylines were often small in scope and just meant to let the characters bounce off of each other. SpongeBob and Patrick try to sell chocolates, or they have to paint Mr. Krabs' house without getting paint on his belongings. I really think that simplicity was part of the show's genius. Oh, but don't genius live in a lamp? Story editor Meriwether Williams said, Steve really did want to keep the stories small. In certain ways, I didn't really understand how to write small stories until I got to SpongeBob. We would write drafts and Steve would say, smaller, smaller. So I learned how to write these really tiny stories. The smaller they are, the more character moments you can have, the more time you can spend with their emotions. And it was within those simple stories that I think you could really see a childlike sensibility that resonated with people. Even though the show was over the top, it was still identifiable on some level. Hooray for lying! Some of the episodes are about things that you probably went through as a kid. The Idiot Box is about having fun by just using your imagination. Sailor Mouth is about discovering bad words. Hi, Squidward! How the f are ya? Life of Crime is about stealing something in the fear of getting caught. We gotta move fast and cover our tracks. I'm on it, SpongeBob! Even Wormy was similar to an experience in my childhood when I found a caterpillar in the front yard and became super attached to it over the course of a single day. And then my parents made me put it back in the yard and let it go. And I cried my eyes out. Could have let me keep the caterpillar. I was clearly attached to it, but I'm not bitter. It's a low maintenance pet is all I'm saying. Put it in a jar with a leaf and you're basically good, but you know. Meriwether Williams said, Just about every episode was sparked or inspired by something that happened to one of us, or a story from childhood. A lot of things were mined from our actual childhoods. We were recalling the feelings we had as kids, then were laughing about it and at each other as grown-ups. Of all the shows I've worked on, we talked about our childhoods the most on Spongebob. Writer Ken Osborne said, In New Student Starfish, Patrick goes to boating school with Spongebob and gets Sponge in trouble, and they end up fighting in the hallway. All the other students are cheering them on, screaming, Fight! Fight! Until they realize that Sponge and Pat are really lame fighters. They're not even hitting each other. They're just blindly, maniacally swatting at the air, and one of the students says, This is embarrassing. 
Well, that was all based on an actual fight I was in when I was in the 10th grade. Me and this other kid were the two worst lacrosse players on the team, and all the other kids made us fight in the locker room, and everyone was into it and screaming for blood until we actually started fighting. We tried to hit each other but kept missing, then we tried to get each other in a headlock but it looked like we were hugging, then we slipped on some water and both fell down, then the other kids all stopped cheering and went outside to practice. Derek Dryman said, A lot of episodes were inspired from things that happened in our lives. The episode Sailor Mouth was based on a time I got in trouble for saying the F word in front of my mother. The scene where Patrick is running to Mr. Krabs to tattle with Spongebob chasing him is pretty much how it happened in real life. The button on the show where Mr. Krabs swears worse than the boys was inspired by the fact that my mother has a sailor mouth herself. And of course, a major part of the show's childlike charm was Spongebob himself. Spongebob was basically a kid. He was positive, optimistic, energetic, and playful. Or as the creator Steven Hillenburg described him, well-meaning, clean-cut, little nerd. And like a kid, he was also sometimes naive, annoying, and emotional. Meriwether Williams said, In some ways, we always tried to get him to cry. <laughs> Just get out of here, you stupid, dumb animal! <laughs> and I noticed while rewatching the show that there were kind of two versions of Spongebob as a character. There was a two-dimensional version and a three-dimensional version. The two-dimensional version of Spongebob was a caricature. His personality was simplified and exaggerated. He was more childlike. Imagination. More happy-go-lucky. La, 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 la. More dumb. Oh, oh, Mr. Krabs, I didn't know you had heat vision. More excitable. I mean, all my life I wanted to be a jelly spotter and now I'm out here with you guys with the nets and the jars and the jelly more annoying. Night, 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 night. More dorky. Knock, knock. Who's there? <laughs> I am. Bye. More naive. Have you finished those errands? Have you finished those errands? Have you finished those errands? More positive. Now we never have to stop working. Sometimes unusually good at things. How's this good work? Usually, this two-dimensional version of Spongebob showed up in episodes focusing primarily on other characters. So, for example, if an episode was told more from the perspective of Squidward or Mrs. Puff or Plankton, Spongebob was more likely to be flattened into a two-dimensional caricature of himself because his role in that episode was to act as a foil to the other character. You only need three more words! In episodes that focus primarily on Spongebob's point of view, you'd get a more three-dimensional humanized version of his personality with a broader range of nuanced emotions. He would get frustrated, <sighs> eels again, nervous, oh, yeah, I didn't mean, you gotta understand, Patrick, I was trying, uncomfortable, I'm gonna look over here, you do that, defensive, you ain't yours, this is mine, despondent, just leave me and my untied shoes alone, sassy, who cares about a stupid star, it seems like you would care a lot about stupid stars, considering you are one, less naive, you just wanna be friends so you can get your hands on a Krabby Patty, gee, and I thought you were stupid. Sometimes he would be the one getting annoyed by somebody else. Well, it's annoying, so stop it! Why don't I call someone whose job it is to fix it? And that was a big flip of the script, because I think one of SpongeBob's most defining traits was that he was a nuisance. Which was an interesting choice for a show, to have a main character who was hated by most characters around him. Squidward hated him. I hate you! Mrs. Puff hated him. Oh, Neptune, another year with him! Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy hated him. Holy sea cow, it's that sponge kid! The incident bikini bottom residents were frequently annoyed by him. He kept us waiting for a bubble. I don't want to have to report you again. Or if they weren't annoyed, they were terrorized by him in one way or another. What would this town do without you, SpongeBob? Oh, my leg! My leg! It was a careful balance they had to strike, making Spongebob annoying to the characters around him without actually being annoying to the viewers. Those early episodes where they were experimenting with how annoying stuff like his laugh could be. Without, like, without being too annoying. How much people could stand, yeah. Maybe it's your voice. Good one, Patrick. Patrick was the only other character who was really on the same wavelength as Spongebob. <laughs> <laughs> the two of them were basically the children in a world full of adults. And I think that childlike nature was the key to what made it work. There was a sweetness and sincerity to their personalities that made them likable. SpongeBob was the bane of Squidward's existence, and yet he loved Squidward and thought they were friends. This is my best friend, Squidward! Squidward is my best friend in the sea. One of my favorite dynamics on the show was that Squidward hated both Spongebob and Patrick. In the middle of nowhere, with Spongebob and Patrick. 
And yet they always wanted to interact with Squidward for some reason, oblivious to the fact that they were making his life worse. We haven't improved Squidward's day yet. Let's do his house. <laughs> and casually invading his personal space. <laughs> Surprise! And hilariously, Squidward's home, for some reason, was smushed right in between SpongeBob and Patrick's homes, even though there was really no reason they all had to be that close when they were surrounded by so much empty space. SpongeBob was also the bane of Mrs. Puff's existence. He catastrophically failed his boating exams over and over and over, but because of his indomitable optimism, he always believed in his ability to pass. I can pass the test! How many more minutes left in the test? The test is over. That's enough time! I can make up those points! SpongeBob! He just had a way of responding to everything with positivity. I'm going on my lunch break, Mr. Krabs! You got five minutes! Wow! One more minute than yesterday! The truth is, if you knew someone like SpongeBob in real life, you'd hate him. But as a viewer, he was endearing, even when he was driving other characters insane. And he certainly did drive them insane. Squidward, Mrs. Puff, Mr. Krabs. They all lost their sanity at one point or another in a sort of SpongeBob-induced psychosis. Though in Mr. Mr. Krabs' case, he was already kind of a crazy dude. Have you noticed that Mr. Krabs has gone completely inside? I <laughs> Steven Hillenberg's original concept for the show was that the main characters would represent the seven deadly sins. That's what's fun about his character and all these characters being connected with the seven deadly sins, you know, which Steve wanted as a as a theme for this show. Did he really? Yeah, that was wow. it. Each character, for the whole series, the seven deadly sins? The, each character represented a... One of the sure, seven well, deadly sins. And even though having characters rooted in such basic personality traits could easily wear thin, they did a good job of milking those traits for comedy without getting too repetitive. Especially Mr. Krabs being greedy and money obsessed. You'll never get a cent out of me! I'd rather that worm come in here right now and eat you all alive! That could have very easily gotten stale and felt like too much of a one-note joke, but they were creative about finding new ways to use it and getting a lot of mileage out of it. Don't shoot! Okay, okay, shoot me, but, but don't take me money. Donate to the children's fun. Why? What have children ever done for me? And yeah, Plankton's personality was kind of simplistic too. Plankton's dreaming about Bikini Bottom. He was pretty singularly focused on world domination and making others bend to his will. But I think that makes him relatable. It's interesting going back and seeing how much the show changed, even just from season one to season two. Season one, in my opinion, was a little more kitty, a little more cutesy. There were more songs. The vibe of the show was more mellow. It could even feel a little drowsy sometimes. It was a little slower. Sometimes the voice acting was softer. Also, SpongeBob's personality tended to be more serious and less cartoony. And in season one, we get a rare peek behind the characters' homes and behind the Krusty Krab, which almost feels a little wrong. And speaking of behind, some of those behinds had a bit more definition going on in that first season. Season one also had arguably the weirdest and most experimental episodes out of the first three seasons, like Rock Bottom, where SpongeBob ends up in a spooky town full of weird people, Sleepy Time, where SpongeBob enters the dreams of other characters, characters. I was a teenage Gary where Squidward accidentally injects SpongeBob with a serum that turns him into a snail. <laughs> SB129, where Squidward travels to different time periods. It was kind of the reverse of how shows typically do it, where the storylines get more absurd as the show goes on. Some of those season one episodes hit a particular tone that I don't think the show ever hit again, at least not in seasons two and three. And that tone was eerie. Seeing SpongeBob get stranded in this dark, unfamiliar place full of freaky looking creatures and not being able to get back home, it was eerie and kind of unsettling. Especially as a kid, that's a scary scenario. And in SB129, we get this trippy time traveling sequence where Squidward accidentally ends up in the distant future in a vast, empty white void. Then once he starts to realize how utterly alone he is, he experiences existential dread and freaks out trying to go back to the present. I gotta get out of here! <laughs> I wonder if that storyline was also based on a writer's real childhood experience. Seasons 2 and 3 had their share of bizarre sequences, but they usually took place in the characters' imaginations. Squidward hallucinated that SpongeBob was spying on him. Mrs. Puff hallucinated about being in jail and getting stalked by SpongeBob. SpongeBob dreamed about procrastinating too much on his essay. Why didn't you just write your essay? Gonna write an essay. That's what I say. The show really found itself in season 2, and that's not to say that season 1 is bad. It has a lot of classic episodes. But in season 2, the overall pacing was better, the storylines were stronger, and the characters were more well-defined. Jay Lender said, The first few months of any show are chaos. Nobody knows how to draw the characters, nobody knows how to write the characters, the pacing of the shows is off, everything is in flux. It's not until the shows start coming back and you watch them as a viewer, like anyone else would, that you really know what you've been making, and you suddenly say, aha, that's what this show is about. Also, visually, season one looks surprisingly different considering season two came out less than a year later. Season two looks like it could be a cartoon made today, and season one looks like a cartoon made in the early 90s. The image clarity is lower, it's noisy and grainy, there's film scratch,
scratches and dust and inconsistent coloring. The animation is more choppy and uncontrolled. It has that wobbly look that old cartoons had. And that's not to say it looked bad. There's a certain charm to that less polished animation style. In fact, some people prefer it. To close things out, I'd like to pay homage to the show's visual artistry by sharing some freeze frames I've curated from seasons one, two, and three. These are real screenshots from the show. And as this slideshow unfolds, I will be serenading you with a song played on my favorite condiment, because as we all know, unlike in cartoons, in the real world, mayonnaise is an instrument. Thank you.